I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Bigfoot, Man, Beast, or Myth by Jeff Williams The number of reports from respected people, the finding of footprints in areas too remote for pranksters to expect success, lends credibility to the belief that something is out there, but what? There was a downdraft of cool mountain air following Virgil Larson as he moved down the forested slopes of Mount Shasta. Even though weighted down by a chainsaw and tools, Larson moved through the northern California woods with practiced ease. He was a timber faller and he had worked in the woods for 30 of his 47 years. His partner, Pat Conway, was off to the left and Larson could no longer see or hear him. At the base of a towering Douglas fir, Larson sat down for a quick smoke. It was 8.30, Friday, September 3rd. As he smoked and enjoyed the cathedral solitude of the forest, he heard the sound of someone moving toward him from above, the sound of feet breaking the carpet of twigs and underbrush. Idly, Larson looked up and saw a figure moving easily towards him through the light-patterned woods. Must be the Forest Service guy coming down to check what we're cutting, he mused to himself. He glanced back at the figure, which had closed 30 feet, but was moving away at a tangent. Thinking the ranger had missed him, Larson yelled. At that, the figure turned his head towards Larson, as if seeing him for the first time, but kept moving away in long swinging strides. Larson yelled again at the tall figure as it dropped down the ridge a little and disappeared behind a screen of trees. Larson began to get to his feet to see where it had gone. Abruptly, a few dozen feet below him, the tall creature rose from behind a bush and stared baefully at him for a long second before disappearing. At that moment, I realized I didn't know what the hell I was looking at, and that's when I took off. Larson, a normally quiet and reserved man, ran in terror down the other slope to his partner. Together, he and Conway returned to where Larson had been sitting. That is when they first became aware of the stomach-churning odor in the forest. It smelled rotten and rancid, like an old bear hide, Larson recalled. To estimate the creature's size, Conway went behind the bush where it had been. Only by pushing his hat up on a stick could he be located behind the bush that the creature had easily looked over. It had to be about seven feet tall, but I don't know what it was, Larson said. I can only remember it looking over the bush, and I knew it wasn't a bear. Bears don't walk through the woods on two feet. I can only remember from the hairline up. Just dark hair pushed straight back. I can't remember the face at all. Larson studied the burning cigarette between his fingers and quietly admitted he lies awake now wondering what he saw. Was it Sasquatch, the giant ape man that thousands believe stalked the vast mountainous forest regions between Northern California and British Columbia? Larson just shakes his head. The shock of seeing something so strange has blanked his mind on the subject. Larson's foreman, when questioned about the reliability of his faller, was blunt. Let me put it this way, said Ralph Gant. If Larson told me he had seen Jesus Christ, I would believe him. Sergeant Walt Bullington, the deputy sheriff who investigated the sighting, said, I think he's telling the truth and he knows it. He's not falsifying. Larson is just one of numerous reliable men who have spent years in the woods and have nothing to gain but scorn of fellow workers who admit to seeing the giant hairy creature commonly called Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Unquestionably, there are mistaken sightings and outright hoaxes, but the number of reports by respected men, the finding of footprints in areas too remote for pranksters to expect success, 
lends credibility to the belief that something is out there. And that something is generally reported to be about seven feet tall, covered with dark hair and virtually no neck. It has massive shoulders, obviously is heavy, and leaves man-like footprints 14 to 18 inches long and 8 inches wide. The reports are not just a new fad. In April of 1840, the Reverend Elkanah Walker, missionary of the Spokane Indians, wrote a long letter to a superior filled with misgivings on the future of the Indians. They seem as fated to fade away before the whites as the game of their country. In closing, he had a surprising note. I suppose you will bear with me if I trouble you with a little of their superstition. They believe in the existence of a race of giants which inhabit a certain mountain off to the west of us. They say their track is about a foot and a half long. They will carry two or three beams on their back at once. They frequently come in the night and steal their salmon from the nets and eat them raw. If people are awake, they always know when they are coming very near by their strong smell, which is most intolerable. It is not uncommon for them to come in the night and give three whistles. Then the stones will begin to hit their houses. Since that early report, stories of Sasquatch have become legend. One of the most controversial pieces of evidence surrounding the creature centers on a short length of 16 millimeter film shot in 1967 by a rancher named Roger Patterson. Patterson, now dead, said he and his partner, Bob Gimlin, were looking for Bigfoot along the rugged Bluff Creek in Northern California when their horses were suddenly spooked. Patterson was thrown but struggled to his feet with camera in hand to make a jerky film of what appears to be a female Sasquatch moving away rapidly at an oblique angle. The creature turns and looks towards the camera and her ponderous hairy breasts are visible. Precisely because she had hair in her breasts, the film was rejected by many scientists who note that even on gorillas there is virtually no hair. Also, it walked in an upright manner that was unacceptable to most scientists. It was a powerful rolling gait of considerable speed, yet it did not run. However, even the specialists at Disney Studio could not prove the film a fake. A group of Soviet scientists who are searching for their own Bigfoot, which they call more accurately a relic hominoid, viewed the film and agreed that because of the size of the muscles rippling visibly beneath the hairy coat, it was not likely faked. Wrote Dr. Dmitry Didonskoy, chief of the chair of biomechanics at USSR Central Institute of Physical Culture in Moscow, with all the diversity of the locomotion illustrated by the creature in the footage, its gait, as seen, is absolutely non-typical of man. Apart from the film, footprints with a distinctive hourglass outline are the only tangible evidence that such a giant creature may in fact exist. Apart from the film, footprints with a distinctive hourglass outline are the only tangible evidence that such a giant creature may in fact exist, and those footprints trouble the highly scientific mind of Dr. John Napier, a visiting professor of primate biology at the University of London. In his book, Bigfoot, Napier studied hundreds of samples of the broad prints and said, There is a curious and persuasive consistency about the hourglass footprints. They present an aberrant but nevertheless uniform pattern. This is hard to reconcile with fakery. Napier, a specialist in the anatomy of ape and human feet, also studied casts from a set of prints in Bosburg, Washington that stretched half a mile. Napier was surprised to find that the right foot was a club foot, possibly the result of a crushing injury in childhood. It is very difficult to conceive of a hoaxer, so subtle, so knowledgeable, and so sick, who would deliberately fake a footprint of this nature. I suppose it's possible, but it is so unlikely that I am prepared to discount it. Napier concludes by saying, I am convinced that the Sasquatch exists but whether it is all that is cracked up to be is another matter altogether. 
there must be something in Northwest America that needs explaining, and that something leaves man-like footprints. The evidence I have adduced in favor of the reality of Sasquatch is no hard evidence. Few physicists, biologists, or chemists would accept it, but nevertheless, it is evidence and cannot be ignored. This conclusion, even from such an eminent scientist, sticks in the throat of Dr. William Montagna, director of the prestigious Oregon Regional Primate Research Center. In a scathing denunciation of the Sasquatch legend and its investigators, Montagna wrote in the September Primate News, Fascinated by the unknown and goaded by his imagination, man is forever fabricating devils and saints. Nothing is to be gained by arguing with believers. Incapable of sifting reality from fantasy, they swear to have seen the footprints of a Bigfoot or an abominable snowman, Yeti. Even the tricksters who perpetuate these outlandish hoaxes sometimes come to believe in the reality of their creatures. Montagna appears unwilling to at least keep an open mind on Sasquatch, but other eminent scientists are pursuing their investigations. Edward W. Cronin, Jr., a zoologist who spent two years in the Himalayas looking for the Yeti, concluded it had to exist after awakening one morning to find a clear set of prints in light and unmarred snow outside his tent. The Yeti, which may be a smaller, distant relation to the Sasquatch, passed Cronin's tent and proceeded down a steep, and dangerous slope that made it evident to the zoologist that the creature was far stronger than he was. He concluded in an article for the November 1975 issue of The Atlantic, based on his experience, I believe that there is a creature alive today in the Himalayas which is creating a valid zoological mystery. As evidence mounts that both a Yeti and a Sasquatch exist, the question of what exactly it is becomes more pertinent. The leading contender in the minds of a few scientists is Gigantopithecus, a massive creature that existed as late as 500,000 years ago in the Himalayas in China. His few fossil remains indicate he was more than seven feet tall. Dr. Paul Simmons, the senior physical anthropologist at the University of Oregon, told me in an interview that it is conceivable that Gigantopithecus crossed the land bridge to the Bering Strait just as man did some 50,000 years ago. My basic feeling is there is no such thing, but I'm not willing to rule it out, Simmons said. He then added a fascinating bit of evidence that Gigantopithecus might have migrated while other primates, like the gorilla, remained in the tropics. He noted that chimpanzees and gorillas wear their teeth down similarly, and that Gigantopithecus and early man wore their teeth down in the same fashion. So it looks as though there is a similar jaw action, Simmons said. Does that mean they went looking for similar food? At least it means their dietary adaptation was not similar to the chimp and the gorilla who stayed in the tropics. But it is hard to go beyond that he said, if there is something roaming the great northwest forest, why hasn't someone found conclusive proof? Skeletal remains, hair, or fossils? Such questions make thousands of skeptics react like Den Mott, a rancher who has spent most of his 42 years hunting and fishing in the mountains of California. Bigfoot is just a bunch of crap. With all those hunters out there every year, Someone would have found one or shot one by now if it was really there. One man who ardently believes both that Sasquatch is in fact out there, but should never be shot, is Peter Brine, a Britisher, actually he's Irish, in his early 50s. Brine has all the rugged good looks of a professional game hunter, which is precisely what he was for 20 years in Nepal. Then, in 1962, he made two expeditions in search of the Yeti. Although both failed, Brian became convinced the Yeti existed. Then at the urging of Texas millionaire Tom Slick, Brian came to the Northwest to use his hunting skills in finding Sasquatch. 
For six years, Brian has continued his lonely search. What he terms the, quote, ultimate hunt, unquote, but now, instead of a rifle, he carries the camera. From the modest trailer he calls home in the Dales, Oregon, Brian points at the dark, coniferous forest that begins not far away. Once you go 50 feet into these forests, you simply disappear. It is as dense as any jungle, and we're dealing with a nomadic group or individuals who stay in an area only one day before moving on. This adds to the difficulty of finding them. Brian notes that the soil of the Northwest is too acidic for fossils, and that if a Sasquatch did die in the forest, other animals would eat it and scatter the bones within days. With only a handful of the creatures around and thousands of square miles of extremely rugged mountains, it is conceivable for Sasquatch to remain largely invisible. One only has to recall Ishi, the last of a Stone Age Indian tribe who remained hidden with his family in a canyon only eight miles from Oroville, California in the early 1900s until he voluntarily appeared. The Tassaday tribe and other Stone Age people were found in the Philippine jungles only in 1971. The mountain gorilla was not proven until 1902. Brian, who has never seen or heard a Sasquatch, has seen 16 separate sets of prints that he, a veteran tracker, believes to be the real thing. If he feels sure that Sasquatch is out there, why continue to hunt him down? It doesn't seem important except for one reason. We're not going to get protective legislation for something that is not proven. When it's known to exist, there will be expeditions, and some scientific expeditions can be awfully ruthless. We hope there will be full protection to the point where even a scientific expedition from the Smithsonian Institution will not be allowed to collect a specimen. Another veteran Sasquatch hunter is George Haas, a scholarly 70-year-old man who lives in an Oakland, California apartment filled with books and files on Sasquatch. Haas has the most extensive files on Sasquatch in the country, 3,000 news clippings alone. Like Brian, he is strongly opposed to any talk of killing Bigfoot just to prove it exists. The last thing we need to do is shoot or even capture a specimen. It is more than a rare animal. It may be a primitive man. To kill him would be murder. Indeed, why find him at all? To protect him, some argue? But if Sasquatch is proven to exist, there will be more massive hunts by amateurs and professionals alike. It seems all too conceivable that the pressure of organized drives for Sasquatch, complete with helicopters and listening devices as used in Vietnam, would force the creatures totally out of the area or into extinction. Find Sasquatch, to what end? So he can spend his life behind bars in a zoo? Or be constantly probed and prodded by scientists made cranky because they will have to rewrite their concepts of evolution? If Sasquatch exists, and the weight of the evidence that he does is too much to ignore, then it seems best to let him and our dreams continue happily apart. We may find that we enjoy the legend of Sasquatch much more than the smelly beast itself. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.